walking virtually along the world's most revered footpaths and connecting the global community of pilgrims. It's the Sacred Steps Podcast. Available on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Broadcasting from the Shea Mare Studios in Florida. Here's your host, pilgrim backpacker and author, Kevin Donahue. Buen Camino Pilgrims, welcome back to the Sacred Steps Podcast. If you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. My name is Kevin Donahue, pilgrim, backpacker, author, and host of the Sacred Steps Podcast. On this program, we're walking virtually alongside pilgrims and authors, sharing their stories and connecting a community of pilgrims from around the world. After a brief spring hiatus, It's great to be back on the podcast and streaming our next episodes and counting down to the conclusion of season three. Looking at the calendar, I think all of our new episodes will run through late May. I'm walking in Portugal and Spain this summer on the Camino de Santiago, so we'll take our typical summer break and then return with new episodes of the podcast for season four. Believe it or not, season four. Wow. Wow in September 2023. Before we begin, I want to share an update on my book, The Pilgrim's Table. While I had expected to be launching it this month, instead, I have to share that it's not quite ready. You'll remember that The Pilgrim's Table is the story of five pilgrims who come together at an albergue and share a very memorable dinner at the end of the Camino de Santiago. And I'm not an author, And this is my very first fiction book. Um, But I am a storyteller or, or maybe a story collector, story curator. And weaving these five paths of these pilgrims together as a story has been challenging for me. But I'm really proud of the pilgrim's table, the stories, the storyline. But rather than rush it, I want to do it right. I've come to appreciate so many of your stories and how your Caminos have impacted you personally. I want this book to reflect our shared experiences, and I I think it's worth spending more time to get it right. I (laughs) I hope you'll agree. I hope you'll visit thepilgrimstable.com and sign up for my book updates. And who knows? Maybe it'll be ready later this year, and it'll make a great gift for the pilgrim in your life. So thank you so much for your patience, and thank you very, very much for your continued support. Speaking of pilgrimage and the impact of the Camino de Santiago, here's a listener voicemail from Lisa and Mark in Virginia. Hi there. Buenos dias. My name is Lisa Work, and my husband Mark and I will be walking the Camino Primitivo this summer, June 2023. We will be leaving Alexandria, Virginia, which is where we currently live. And I am a seminary student at Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, and arriving in Madrid on June 2nd and We'll travel to Oviedo, where we will um, start our Camino on June 3rd. Our goal is to arrive in Santiago by June 16th or 17th, and then spend a day or two in Santiago, where we will visit the Anglican Center, um, which is at St. Susana's, very close to the Campus Della. Uh, I look forward to um, seeing what kind of experience could be ahead of my husband and I. Uh, This is part of my formation as a priest in the Episcopal Church. I look forward to chatting with you, Buen Camino. Thank you, Lisa. If you're planning your Camino, walking now or recently returned, I'd love to share some of your thoughts on the podcast. Visit sacredstepspodcast.com to record your very own voicemail so we can share it right here on a future episode. 
and you can receive updates on all of our upcoming shows by tapping subscribe in your podcast app or on YouTube. If you would be so kind as to take a moment, do right now, it would be great. Take a moment and leave a star rating or a comment on your podcast app. That is so greatly appreciated. Let me tell you, not only do I get a little message when somebody leaves a comment or somebody leaves a, a five-star review, but it also helps Apple and Spotify and YouTube and all the others know which shows to recommend to those interested in walking the Camino de Santiago or any of the pilgrim routes that we've been discussing on this program over the last three seasons. And that's critically important because if you can remember back to when you first started thinking about walking the Camino and you said, I'd really love to hear other people's experiences. And I think this podcast and several of the podcasts that are out there are great ways to listen to firsthand experiences of pilgrims and authors. So thank you for taking a moment right now and dropping a comment and a five-star review. Quick subscriber message. This comes from Angela in the United States. Kevin, thank you so much for the Camino 101 live stream you did with Ann Bourne. That was so helpful to me in planning my Camino this year. Between the two of you, I think you had a suggestion for just about everything on my list. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you, Angela. Buen Camino. That was a lot of fun recording with Ann, who is just a lovely, smart, experienced pilgrim that I respect so much. And and you're right. We have we have input, opinions on just about anything you ask us. It's one of our strengths, Ann and I. Our 90 plus minute live stream from a month or so ago is streaming on our podcast archives at sacredstepspodcast.com. You can also find it on your podcast app, on YouTube, or on our Facebook page. For more short videos answering your questions, Angela, about your upcoming Camino, everything from how to prevent blisters to how to budget for the journey, you'll find more Camino 101 videos now streaming on YouTube. I hope that helps you. Buen Camina, Angela. On today's episode, we're walking virtually alongside author Brian J. Skillen and his partner, Chelsea. Earlier this season, Brian and Chelsea were walking the Camino and sharing their stories um, during our podcast, little updates from each city that they were walking through. Uh, Many of you know Brian from a series of Camino books, including The Way Through a Field of Stars, his second book, Back Through a Field of Stars, Brian's third book, Home Through a Field of Stars, launched recently on Kickstarter and is now available on Amazon and his website. I think I fanboyed a little in this interview, and you probably hear it talking about the Camino, the experience this past year of Brian and Chelsea, and how it differs for some of their previous Caminos. And of course, Brian's trilogy, Through a Field of Stars, which follows a fictional tale of the Knights Templar with the Camino Francais and Santiago de Compostela as the backdrop to the series. You can find the links to Brian's book, his website, and more from our discussion in the show notes of your podcast app. With that, here's my interview with author Brian J. Skillen and his partner Chelsea on the Sacred Steps podcast. Brian and Chelsea, welcome to the Sacred Steps podcast. Hey, Kevin, great to be here with you today. Yeah, it's really nice to be here after we've been on this journey together. I feel like we know each other because we just basically walked an entire Camino together with you two checking in from your journey and me living vicariously through the two of you. So <laughs> welcome we've, we've been there. We've been there through sickness and health. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I want to get into your most recent Camino in a moment, but I think we have to start at the very beginning of this journey. Yeah. How did you first learn about the Camino de Santiago? Brian? Yeah, sure. So um, I first, the way I first learned about, so before writing, I'm actually a dancer. So I travel the world teaching dance and performing. I've taught in over 32 countries around the world, usually travel for about six to nine months out of the year, every week, different country, different city. And on one of my tours in 2007, um, I was in Spain. I had some extra time. And uh, I, I, my friend was like, oh, have you ever heard of the Camino de Santiago? I was like, no, what is that? And so I looked it up. There wasn't much resources online or anything at the time. 
So uh, I ended up found what I could. I ended up on the Primitivo route and it wasn't very well marked back then. I got totally lost. I ended up hurting my knees and they gradually got worse and worse and worse until the last day I couldn't walk into Santiago. I had to take a bus and at, but you know, it worked out okay because when I got to Santiago, like I hobbled in, you know, old man style and <laughs> one of the only people, it was off season. So one of the only other people in there was this old lady and she was crying in, in one of the front rows. And I walk up and I say, are you okay? And she's kind of nozzle. I said, can I hold you? So I give her a big hug. Turns out like her husband had died and she was taking, she had MS and she was taking a Camino down on, um, by car, you know, by this bus, oh and she didn't have anybody left in the world. And she was all alone in the church. And had I not hurt my knee, I wouldn't have been able to be that person, that extra pilgrim to be on that Camino with her. So it turned out okay. Um, and I vowed that I would come back again. So fast forward to 2016, I went out and I got to the Arc of San Antone. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? It looks like something out of Game of Thrones or Lord of Rings. And uh, just past that, I got to the, behind that, I got to the hill city of Casa Jerez. And if you've ever been there, I mean, it is epic. It's just this hill with a castle on top. And I was just amazed. Then when I checked into the albergue, which, um, is like the pilgrim shelter for those who haven't walked the Camino yet. Uh, the stamp for the city was the um, Cross of Jerusalem, which had five Templar crosses on it and, uh, you know, four around and one in the middle. And, you know, I said, oh, the Knights Templar. And he's like, the albergue guy, uh, Hospitero was like, oh, what do you know about the Knights Templar? I said, I don't know. What do you know about the Knights Templar? And we got into this great conversation about the Templar and the history in the region. And that night, you know, he said, look for the clues the Templars left behind. And I woke up the next morning and I was hooked. I took my dance shoes out of my bag. I left them at a secondhand store. I said, I'll trade these in for a story. And, you know, as a dancer, that's your most valuable possession. So I traded them in. And every day after that, um, the book, like I got this book, it's here physical now, but the way through a field of stars, uh, it played like a movie in my head. The people I saw, the experiences that I had, like all came together into this like awesome narrative. <laughs> That's incredible. I, I'm just sitting here and I'm looking at Chelsea and Brian's telling this story and it's just like, I'm sure you've heard it a hundred times, Chelsea, but it's like, that's so engaging. Like, this is how you fell in love with the Camino. There's this yeah. old lady. It is, you know? it yeah, is I mean, pretty cool. And I've heard it so many times, but every time it's like, wow, that's like how this book, how Brian's books got inspired. And there's so much more to it. Like when you're on the Camino and you can actually see the places that are in the books and it, yeah, it's really cool. And it's even more in depth than that. That was the short version, if you can believe it. That's the, that's the cliff notes version. We, I yeah, want to get into a little deeper into it. Brian, uh, sure. Brian J. Skillen is the author of the Through a Field of Stars trilogy. We're going to be talking about the books here in a moment. Uh, because the books are a big part of how I was able to connect with the two of you. Mm -hmm. You have what's now a trilogy. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. But it, they come from a place that makes the Camino, uh, presents the Camino in an entirely fresh way. And so for me, I have a lot of our pilgrims here and we're experiencing like firsthand pilgrimage. Um, these books are taking the Camino and placing them in a, their historical context, but also with some great storytelling. I want to get into it in a moment, but yeah. I think I have to ask the question because you come from, and, and both of you actually are performers and you come from, um, uh, an, an art background and a visual and dance background. What inspired you to write a book? And when we started with the first one, the way through a field of stars. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, you know, just that conversation with the hospitero talking about that, like when he said, you know, look for the codes that the Templars left behind. I just, things just kept coming up. I just kept seeing all this different stuff and it literally played like a movie in my head. I'm not joking. Usually I'm one of those early walkers, but don't worry. I pack up really quietly. I take my bags out of the room and pack up outside. We all know those early morning people who are promises, promises, no crinkling yeah. bags. <laughs> No creakly bag. So if you're listening to this, your one big takeaway, if you wake up early, take your bag out of the room first before you pack up. Um, so anyways, so I usually walk about 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning because I love just walking under the stars by myself. And this book literally played itself like a movie in my head. It was like watching a movie as I was walking. 
And as I walked, I would just dictate what I was seeing into my microphone. And each day, um, new things would happen or I'd see new things. That I was like, oh, that's really weird. What, what is that? And the people I met, like my um, Camino family became characters in the book. So they're all based off of real people. And the people who aren't based on real people are based off historical figures. So which is pretty cool. But yeah, that's really what inspired me. And it was kind of my way of continuing my pilgrim and sh- pilgrimage after it was done and sharing it with sharing my Camino family with other people because they were amazing. You know, like I, my goal of this book is I, I want to inspire a million people to go walk the Camino, to have a life changing experience. Like that's what I want to do. And I, I'm just so excited for it. But funny story is, and Chelsea can jump in on this in a second. So I actually grew up with dyslexia in a third grade reading and spelling level in high school. So I never thought I'd write a book, right? What was a disadvantage in school became an advantage with dancing because I could turn things backwards around in my head pretty easily. Oh, that's but great. I never thought I'd write a book, right? So when I did this, I dictated everything. And then I got back and I was like, oh, crap, how am I going to do this? And so like I sat down. But what I did is I find, um, you know, if you have big enough why, the how can be overcome. Mm. Right? And so my wife in this was to inspire people to have this life-changing adventure. And the how was I, I committed myself to writing 2,000 words a day, no matter what. <laughs> and I pretty much had to reteach myself the English language. I didn't know anything about grammar. My spelling was all messed up, thank God for Grammarly. Um, and at first it would take me all day. But within 50 working days, I had written a 100,000 word book, like literally 50 days, wrote a 100,000 word book going from nothing. But it was because I committed to 2,000 words a day, and I thought it was the best thing ever. I was like, this is God-inspired. It's amazing. <laughs> and then I just had started dating this young lady, and I was like, I'm going to impress her. I'm going to show her my book. <laughs> and so I showed it to Chelsea, and she said. <laughs> I think I said something like, eh, it needs some potential. Oh, no, it has some potential, but it needs some work. That's it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I, w- I was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but she was right. So we spent the next like three years learning everything we could about writing and publishing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the author's journey, I sent out like 50 query letters, got back two rejection letters and 48 other agents didn't even bother right write back to me and then enter COVID, right? So my dance business is shut down. That's like, thir- you know, I had a very thriving business all over the mm-hmm. world. It's completely shut down. And I was like, great, now what's, I've got all these rejection letters. So what we did, is we turned to Kickstarter. And for our first book, I'll show it again because I love it. It's so pretty. Uh, we, we actually raised uh, $10,000 in 30 days to uh, raise wow. everything that we needed. Yeah, uh, to raise everything to, that we needed to make the book, an audio book, get covers. Now, just for you people at home that are not in publishing, the average book in a lifetime only sells around 500 copies. We were doing that, almost did that, before the book launched to Amazon or anywhere else. So just kind of wrap that around. Like, I mean, it was an incredible thing uh, that that happened and I'm so grateful for all of our backers. And it gave us like a community of support, like our supporters who have gone through three Kickstarters with us now. We've raised about $30,000 for our books, just shy. Um, on the last one, we would have done better, but we got, we'll talk about that one a little bit, but we still <laughs> made our goal, but we'll talk about that in the venture. But yeah, so it's just been a, it's been a crazy ride. And now we're teaching authors how to publish their books, which has been like really cool. Well, which is great because uh, as my audience will tell you, I need all the help I can get. So uh, <laughs> offline, Brian and Chelsea are going to be uh, sitting over me, making sure I write 2000 words That's a right. day, 2000 words a day, no matter what. <laughs> here, we've got the whole trilogy, starting with the way through the field of stars uh, mm-hmm. by author Brian J. Skillen. You'll find links to the website, links to the book uh, on Amazon. Um, and just a quick comment. All of those are in the show notes, but go to Brian's website because as Brian said, most authors don't get the chance to sell their books and most of them don't get the chance to sell their books directly. So um, in order to support artists, whenever you can uh, visit their website and there's also an opportunity for signed copies as well. So if you want to see Mm -hmm. Brian J. Skillen's uh, signature in your book, it's a great way to get a signed copy. So let's talk about let's go back and start with the way through the field of stars, right? Sure. Because you combine two really incredible historical phenomena, right? That have gained such a following culturally, the Camino de Santiago and the Knights Templar. 
Yeah. Where did you start to see the intersection of these? You said the gentleman said, look for these codes. I mean, we're talking in the book, there's secret codes and ancient orders yeah. and love and friendship and ciphers and adventure. And, and this is a great book. So how does this story, you said, play out like a movie? How does it begin to unfold? How does it, how does it reveal itself to you, Brian? Well, so let me go back to that conversation. When I was talking with this hospitero, I mean, he told me, he just told me so much, like right down to the hill in Casa Jerez is actually hollowed out with tunnels underneath. And Chelsea and I have actually visited these tunnels. We'll put up some videos at some point, but there's tunnels underneath the hilled city that he said the Templars used to use for things. Now, I mean, he could have been full of it. I don't know. But, you know, there's different things that came up um, as I was walking. You know, we saw a lot of, you know, the all seeing eye, like, so a triangle with an eye inside of it. We, you know, some stuff is, you know, fictional in there, but a lot of the stuff you can still see, like right down to when I was in uh, Santiago, you know, they have the pillars there and there's all the Masons marks on it. Right. So uh, if you don't know what those are, like, so they were from the stone Masons would uh, put marks in the bricks so you could see which quarry it came from. So they knew who they could pay. Now I thought, well, I didn't know what they were at the time. So I was like, oh my God, secret code. But I later learned, you know, that's what they were. But within there too, I thought, how cool would it be cool? How cool would it be for the Templars to have left a secret code in plain sight amongst these Mason's marks? And that was how some of it started, plus all these other things that I was seeing along the way inside the art. Mostly, it was really interesting. I'd find a lot of things. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but the cathedrals are all facing east-west, right? So you have, uh, they're all facing east towards Jerusalem. And, you know, a lot of stuff I'd find in like the northeast corner, uh, which is, is very interesting uh, if, with some of these mystery schools. Northeast corner is a very interesting thing. And so, yeah, you would, I found a lot of stuff there. Uh, and it was, it was pretty fascinating. But anyways, you can, there's stuff in the book, you know, like even some of the stuff that I have put in here has actually been changed um, and other, other things too. So, and that I've seen come up. So there used to be like an all seeing eye in Santiago, which is the triangle with the eye inside of it. Right. There used to be one of those inside the cathedral of Santiago in the dome looking down, but they painted over it. And then another thing, uh, which is very interesting is in Leon, there's so much stuff in Leon in the cathedral of Leon. Oh my God. There's like green men, there's, um, you know, Camus, there's Balf Balfamet, you know, like all these other like representations of different things in there. But behind the Virgin Blanco, so this this was fascinating too. Um, I love the Camino because it always provides, right? <laughs> you know, you like it's it's just amazing the way things happen. So I happened to be there on Good Friday, and I went into the cathedral, and once again, kind of in the northeast corner, um, there is a the original statue of the Virgin Blanco, which used to be on the outside of the church, one of the most famous statues there. They brought it inside and put in that chapel now. It's a very long, tall um, statue, and you can't see behind it. But the day that I was there, which was Good Friday, it was open. That that like you know chapel was open, and it's never open. <laughs> I've been there three, four other times, and it's never been open besides that one time. And behind it was something very interesting. It was a severed head, um, which in Templar symbology it it means some things. I'm not going to give away. You can read about it in the book, but it's, it's in there. I mean, it could also be John the Baptist too, but like really with everything else inside that chapel, it really indicated that uh, that was one of the things. So, but I've gone back three times and I've tried to get into that chapel and they're like, no, it's never open. You can't get in. <laughs> so, so it's just kind of interesting. In the books, um, we have, we have these characters that are drawn from real life, right? Including yeah. our central heroine, um, Princess Isabella from France. Mm -hmm. You've got yeah. uh, King Philippe, you got Pope Clement and, yeah. and uh, there's an awful lot of history that's sort of brought into um, a fictional context. If I'm not so well versed on 14th century history, um, mm -hmm. Brian, um, yeah. is this, a, is this a good read for me? Absolutely. And Chelsea can answer this one. <laughs> so do you want to take that or should I? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not a history buff and I like, <laughs> Yeah, so I was the, what we call the alpha reader, the first person to read the book. Um, and so I would read through it. And I, I'll be honest, I just fall asleep if uh, 
there's too much going on, especially history stuff. And so I would just be like, oh, it's too boring. It's going too slow. Take that out. Take that out. Um, and so <laughs> um, we decided that we were going to make an appendix in the back of the book so that the story still flowed. It's still, you know, it's a pretty quick book once you get started with it. Um, but you can still read up on the history of each of the historical characters and some of the places and the appendix. Um, and that was because the history, like I'm not the history person and it was mm-hmm. just a little too much for me. Well, this was actually one of my favorite parts of the book. I mean, I hate the storytelling is fantastic, right? But the appendix, the way that you've actually noted, you know, how we're pulling from the historical context, this adds richness and depth for me to the book because, mm-hmm. you know, I've, you can fall in love with the characters, but then when you're like, oh, this is really happening to the, like yeah. poor Prince, you know, this is. So I, I could spend an entire episode fanboying over the book, but I want to focus a little of my passion uh, towards the places that kind of find their way into the book. So take us back. You mentioned a few spots um, from the first book, but what are some yeah. of those cities and areas that Camino pilgrims would instantly recognize? And then the next time they're on the Camino, they're like, oh, yeah, that's from totally. Through a Field of Stars. You know, one of my favorite things to do on the Camino is show people the different things from the book in the different cities. And I've even, I've even had people like, uh, you know, send me pictures of things. They're like, oh, my God, this is it. And I was like, yeah, that's it. It's cool. <laughs> um, so it's pretty awesome. But yeah, so pretty much, obviously, the Arc of San Antonio and Castle Jerez to start with. So on that, on that Camino, I started in Burgos and walked from Burgos to Santiago. So the first book takes place pretty much from... Burgos, well, the Arc of San Antonio, essentially, all the way to Santiago. So in that one, you're going to see Arc of San Antonio, uh, Castle Jerez, and I highly recommend staying in the Arc of San Antonio if you get a chance. It is amazing to just stay in the ruins of this old monastery. So I highly recommend that. Then when you get into Castle Jerez, uh, there's these very memorable skull and crossbones on a church, and it says, O death, O eternity, but in Latin. And so that's a very interesting thing when you walk by that you can see. Um, then going past there, you know, uh, what's next? Well, Leon, obviously the Cathedral of Leon, we talk a lot about green men in there because they hold one of the codes. The green men hold a code in, in the book. And so you can see all the green men. I think at 32, I, I think there's like 32 or 40 green men throughout the cathedral. And this is interesting too. Like when I first went to, uh, to on that pilgrimage and I was getting all this information, on the audio guide, they talked about the green men and all the pagan mm-hmm. symbology and different things in the church. Every other time after that, it's completely changed. It's not there anymore. It's like you, it, like they changed the audio. I was like, okay, that's fine. But it's, it's just a very interesting thing because that's how I learned a lot of this stuff. As I was listening to this stuff, I was like, oh, that's fascinating. Green men. Oh, amazing. But anyway, so the green men in Leon, Astorga, um, you can see... Uh, you can see like behind the, the crucifix up there, there's a, a triangle with a head in it, a severed head in it, uh, which is kind of interesting. And I need then, to pay uh, more attention. Yeah, people, you know, you just, you just walk <laughs> there's by. There's so much things. to see that you're sort of uncovering. I'm like, wait, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then my, one of my favorites is from the second book. So the second book takes place pretty much from St. John P. de Port you know, to the end, but mainly St. John Peter Port to Burger, you know, because it, it reflected that. And once again, the people I met became characters. Oh my God, I love these guys. I, I'm still in contact with all of them. So much fun. But in Pamplona, they have two cathedrals there. So there's the old cathedral and the new cathedral. The old cathedral is uh, San Centurno. And when I was in there, it has, you know, I was talking about all the cathedrals facing east-west, right? And so I'm in there and it has two distinct cathedrals, like one here and one here inside right? It's, it's, it's kind of been changed. And it wasn't making sense that where the altar was, was facing, it was facing a different direction. But then I went back and I looked and the other altar where the original church was, is actually facing east. And within that one, there's this awesome representation of, I I guess, I don't know, the rapture maybe. And then above that, you know, you have the all seeing eye above Jesus, above God's head, like in that image. And then above that, you have a Templar uh, writing in a severed hand, like it, it's just like I don't know. There's so much fun stuff. Tell them about Osibrero. What about Osibrero? The witches. Oh, yeah, so Osibrero. There are also witches good. in Osibrero. Yeah, there's story. Yeah. Yes, yeah. My mind like, is just exploding have, right now. And if you know, like 
the first time we walked the Camino, a local was telling us about the the witches that were in town. We we're like, what are you talking about? And then when we knew that and we kept our eye out, you'll see like witches that are carved out on mailboxes or on a lamppost. And of course, like Osaburo is known for um, like the thatched roof that kind of looks like a witch's hat. And so that's part of that's part of the book and pretty recognizable uh, when you're up on the top of the mountain, especially when it's a cloudy day and it looks a little eerie. A little creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, speaking of that, too, we also put in legends, too. So there's like inside in Osobrero, there's also the, and I'm probably saying it wrong. I'm so, I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, there's uh, a legend, a Holy Grail legend uh, in the church there. And so I put legends from the Camino inside these books too. Mm -hmm. So it not only has mm -hmm. just like the general historical history, you know, historical fictions aspect, but I also incorporate at least two or three Camino legends um, so you can go through. One of the things that I'm really excited about that we have not made yet was that what we started was a companion guide. And so we were on the Camino just recently. And one of the things that we were doing was taking more pictures because when Brian and I went together in 2019, we were just soaking it all in and we came back and we're like, oh, wait, we didn't take very many pictures of all these places. So when we just went back, um, that uh, well, the Camino we just got back from, like we were intentionally taking pictures of all the places in the books so that we can make a companion guide so that when you're reading it, we can say, oh, this is where chapter one takes place. Oh, this is where chapter three is. This is the cathedral uh, so that you can actually see a picture. Um, and if you can't make it to the Camino or if you just want to remember what the, those places are, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And it hasn't come out yet. Yeah. Something to it look kinda, forward to. Yeah. It so, kind of turns the Camino into a big scavenger hunt in a way. <laughs> so you're just looking for all these different things. And once you know what to look for, you start finding all these crazy things everywhere. I love it. So if you're, if you're Dan Brown, Spidey senses are, are ringing, this yeah. is definitely uh, in the vein uh, of some of those epic books. Uh, our guest today on the Sacred Step podcast is Brian John Skillen. Uh, we're talking about the books and the series, the trilogy Through a Field of Stars. The first book, The Way Through a Field of Stars. The second book, Back Through a Field of Stars. And most recently, Home Through a Field of Stars. Follow oh, we've got yeah, there you go. <laughs> cover cover count. So uh the the books follow the heroine um Princess Isabella and this sort of series of of quests and discoveries that that unfold. Um don't want to reveal too much from the books, but uh, the second book, uh, Back Through a Field of Stars, actually starts to introduce new character sets, including these two great nuns who are uh, making their Camino pilgrimage. And I'm just wondering, like in character selection, you know, yeah. if you think about um, these Tolkien quest or Chaucer quest, there's always a, you know, very diverse uh, series of characters that introduce themselves. So, and the the nuns encounter some different characters that, um, that, 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 kind of add to color and character of the story. But I'm wondering, um, you know, the nuns are sort of carrying secrets. How did, how did, we, how did the, how do we get nuns entrusted with making this uh, journey to Santiago de Compostela? Yeah, sure. Well, we meet the nuns in the first book. Right. Um, and so they're in Carrion de las Condas where, where they meet them there. And, the, but they're just minor characters and they're actually based off of uh, a couple of, you know, women that I met on my Camino and I just, the thing about them was I love their friendship so much. They just had this, this such a tight friendship. And I wanted to put that into the book. But anyways, how did the nuns get entrusted with the, with the secret codes? Well, um, it's because, oh, I don't want to give anything away. But Well, don't give it away. But just the, the choice of characters here. Because, you know, Princess Isabella has um, a whole cadre of, of companions yeah. and, and uh, ambassadors on her behalf. So I... You know, the the, uh, the choice of nuns was just very interesting. I thought that was, so, uh, it adds great depth to the story. Let's just put it at that. Nobody expects a nun and nuns exactly. can be the perfect spies. <laughs> I don't know if you've been watching Warrior Nuns, but it's like one of our favorite TV shows. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, you have to watch it on Netflix. Um, but yeah, so the nuns, so they got a bigger role because, yeah, like they solve problems. So I, I really don't know what's going to happen when I write. Like... I just sit there and I just let it talk, like whatever it is, just come through. And then later on I go and edit. It's just like, just like watching a movie. And so these guys, they fixed a problem for me. Mm. So the problem was I had somebody stuck 
And then the other problem is, so historically, so Jacques de Molay was the last grandmaster of the Templars. And he was the one, he got imprisoned by King Philip and, and Pope Clement, right? So Molay has to make a choice. He's in Paris and he has to make a choice, either stay there and sacrifice himself or uh, leave and whatnot. So in order to keep up a guise, he stays in Paris and he entrusts the nuns with the word uh, that they have to take across, across the Camino, essentially, to get to our lead hero, our male hero in the story, ATN, which he's a very interesting character too. And uh, I'm writing his, his, uh, the prequel to a book, his origin story called The Black Templar right now, um, because ATN's black. And, you know, this happened, this actually unraveled with, I was writing the first book, read as Black Lives Matters happened. And I was reading in some of the Templar groups, and a lot of them were just amazing and awesome, but there was a few that were kind of scary. <laughs> and I, I was just like, you know, I, like, so within, within like a week, I rewrote the book pretty much to have him as uh, like, as a, he, he went from a white, <laughs> the book originally went from a white male lead to Isabel being the lead character and him being a black Templar coming into it. But it was just, it was really, I don't know. It was just like the switch that happened at the last moment, but it made my story so much richer because then I but, could pull in all sorts of other things. That's great to know. And it, it unfolds, you know, you know, I know changing a book can sometimes be um, very challenging from personal experience, but um, as you go through the, the story just unfolds and we see Etienne uh, coming in, um, with his companions and the third book, uh, home through a field of stars, um, as they reunite and try to find seven keys. So, um, yeah. great trilogy of books through a field of stars, uh, by Brian J. Skillens. The conversation continues momentarily. For information and links from the show, visit sacredstepspodcast.com. Know someone considering pilgrimage? Share this episode as a text from your device. To support the show, please leave a star rating in your podcast app. And now, the Sacred Steps Podcast continues. Down below in the show notes, go ahead and click that link to uh, Brian's homepage at throughafieldofstars.com. Um, you can pick up the whole trilogy and also working on some audio books and such as well. So that's pretty yeah, exciting. We have two audio books out, one more coming. So obviously we're, we're three kind of Camino junkies talking about this great, uh, pilgrimage book series, um, through a field of stars earlier this season, we've sort of followed you, Brian and Chelsea yeah. on your 2022 Camino <laughs> pilgrimage, um, which there's a lot going on in 2022, right? Oh, so this yeah. was a holy year. We had a lot of, let's just say, um, people had been indoors for a couple of years and they're finally breaking out. And so being on the Camino in 2022 um, was the opportunity to be with a lot of your friends. But I'm wondering if you'll kind of give us some highlights you shared in our previous episodes and in some of your uh, check-ins along the Camino, what was different and what was unique. But I wonder what you'll remember most about what is this your fifth Camino? It, it's uh, yeah, this is the fifth time I've been on the Camino. Yeah. What will you remember most about this year's Camino de Santiago? Well, that's pretty easy for me. Um, I, so there's a lot of down parts, but like, and but my favorite part was actually happened at Cruz de Ferro, and it's the realization like this really made me realize I'm not walking this for me, like just being there for somebody else as opposed to being you. Cause this is the first time I've actually like gone on the community with the purpose of like promoting my books or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we were so wrapped up in that and involved in that, that I feel like we missed part of the experience. And then, you know, something happened to us. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute, but we had this beautiful moment with this young man, um, at Cruz de Ferro, we were the only people there, you know, nobody else. And if you get, if you guys have walked the Camino, there's always people at Cruz de Ferro. We're the only people there. And I'd spoken with him once before and he, he wanted to stay at a monastery because he wanted a blessing from a monk or a priest or something like that. And you could tell he's working on, and he's one of these guys that, you know, six foot four, looks like a Viking, very successful, you know, like he's 22, just like beautiful soul, like 
but he had hit some dark, dark times and he had left, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, he left it, it, like everything behind to try to get out of that dark time. And he was looking for just like that, that connection and that prayer and, and whatnot. And we got to pray for him on top of Cruz de Ferro. But not only that, wow. like there's something so powerful, like when you can be vulnerable with another man, like, you know, and it's easy, you know, it's like, especially, you know, when you're like kind of like a man's man, you know, like sort of thing to like let down those walls and just allow yourself to be vulnerable. And me and him could relate to a lot of different things because he'd led a very successful life with what he was doing. And I'd love it very, like there's just a lot of levels that we could meet on uh, that. I don't know. It was just like, I felt like God put me there to be in that moment with him and just be there with him. And now he's doing great. I just texted with him today and he's like, his life is back on track still. And he's like got a new job. And I, I don't know. It was just a very beautiful moment and a, a very weird moment too. Cause he said, uh, that we are his Camino parents. <laughs> and and okay. Chelsea and I were like, you mean brother and sister, right? And he's like, no, you're my Camino parents. I was like, oh no. <laughs> we created this awesome thing called the Totally Awesome Over 40s Club. And <laughs> Chelsea was an honorary member. <laughs> yeah, we'll let Chelsea in. Yeah. 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 But I so think that- with the Cruz de Ferro, like, so for those that, that don't know, Cruz de Ferro is oh, yeah. the highest point on the Camino and it's you're supposed to bring a rock from home and carry it as like a burden that you're taking with you and you're dropping it off at the cross at the top of the highest point. And so it wasn't just that like Brian had the chance or that we had a chance to be with this guy, but we were actually sitting just on Cruz de Ferro for a whole hour and no other pilgrim came up oh, wow. for that entire hour. And we've both been there before and there's just so many people, you know, it's the middle of the day, like where is everyone? We're at the peak season. Where is everyone? And it, I, it was really odd, but it was really special, like Brian said. Yeah, yeah, very, very special. So that's what I always remember. Uh, what about you, Chels? Uh, you know, I, so this is my second time walking the Camino in full, and full kind of in quotes for the second time. But, um, I, you know, the first time was right after we got married. And so it was kind of the tail end of our honeymoon. We walked the Camino de Santiago and we had a limited time. And so we were kind of booking it. So we were on a different schedule than anyone, everyone else. And so although we saw pilgrims um, that we had previously seen, we didn't really have that experience of Camino family. And so this time walking, uh, we really had that sense of Camino family and got to walk with some people on a regular basis and really get to know them past surface level. Um, which you get to know people past surface level pretty quickly on the Camino, but even deeper, it's just really nice to do that um, and have that experience to walk it with a group of people. That's beautiful. So the two of you have sort of intimated that you, you had some, some unusual periods during your Camino. Uh, you, yeah. For those that are listening to the, the podcast stream, Chelsea was using like air quotes at one point about the full Camino and Brian said, yeah, we had this thing that was uniquely happened to us. Um, I feel like I have to ask you, so did anything unique happen to you on the Camino de Santiago this <laughs> well, year? I don't, I don't know how unique it is, but we got COVID on the Camino and it sucked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, a lot of the albergues and hostels, like they were kicking out people if they knew they were sick. So it's, you know, we, thankfully we were staying at a, Donativo Albergue, where the hospitalero, did I say that right? Yeah, he was just so generous and so gracious with us and like helped us find a hotel that would take us in um, and get us situated. Um, well, at first, we, we didn't know it was COVID at first. So yeah, that's true. I, that's true. I'd gotten this, this weird heat rash that got infected. And actually, looking back at it, it might have been a COVID rash because apparently people get those. But I had this weird rash that got infected or whatnot. And I was running a fever of like 102 or something like oh, wow. that. And so yeah. we went to we went to the hospital, we went to the emergency room. And when I was in there, like actually before we went to the hotel first, checked in. Um, then I took a COVID test because like, oh no, I hope I don't have this. And then like it was negative, and I was like, whew, okay, great, just weird rash. 
And then I went to the, and then I went to the emergency room. They're like, we need to test you again. So I tested, I tested positive and it just sucked. Like it was like, we, we isolated, we self-isolated, we took ourselves off the Camino, which I don't think everybody did, but like we did because we didn't want to give it to anybody else. And so we got a private hotel room um, and we were just so grateful that we had the ability to do that because I don't know like what we would have done, but it was still a very hard experience because like literally we couldn't, um, we could barely walk to the park without getting winded. We got brain fog. I'm trying to, so we're doing a Kickstarter. So just for you guys at home to know, we were actually running our Kickstarter. You have 30 days to raise money for your books. Like I've spent a year planning this campaign and finishing this book and I need, you know, want to make it happen. And so we only promoted for five days and then COVID happens and we get completely knocked out. I have brain fog and I have to get print edits to, oh man, it just was a mess. <laughs> but well, and, and your was... body is physically tired too, right? Because you've been having yeah. a physical experience in the days prior and you're getting up and you're, you know, while you have, you have some, you have rest, right? But it, sometimes it's not as restful um, yeah. when you're in an albergue or you're, if you know, I sleep better at home than I do anywhere in the world, regardless of the finest yeah, totally. hotel or the sleeping on a, on a cot. Right. Um, but totally. your body can sometimes be tired and then you couple, you know, an infection with it, that, that had to be, yeah. you know, compounding well, the situation. There was more than just that. I like, I had two other things happen to me as well during this time. I mean, it was like, I went to the doctors like three times, <laughs> totally sucked. <laughs> Maybe more. But, so, yeah, so Brian is the new poster funny. child for the Spanish healthcare system. So <laughs> I know. Right? If, you, if you can't find I've, him I've in his book, look for him on the yeah, Exactly. <laughs> I'd buy a book so I could pay my medical bills. There you go. No, I'm just joking. No. Um, but the well, I think one of the great like, things, yeah, I was going to say one of the great things, yeah. though, was that not great things, but so I, the first week Brian was sick and I was able to kind of leave and get grocery get groceries things that we could heat up in the microwave really quick mm -hmm. in the kitchen when no one was there with a mask you know and then go eat it in her room but i was able to take care of brian and then the day he was uh better and being and we thought okay we're gonna get on the camino again we're gonna start walking then i woke up with a fever and so we were at the hotel room for at least two weeks days. yeah, yeah. Was it oh, i thought it was, it was no more. it was more than yeah maybe it's 14 days, days. yeah yeah. Yeah. And so I kind of, then Brian took care of me and he still wasn't feeling a hundred percent, but at least like the COVID symptoms have subsided and was able to get out and go to the grocery store. Um, yeah. So in the middle of the Camino, we had two weeks that we were just in a single private hotel room, which was not what we were expecting. And no. uh, a funny thing about that though, is the hotel room was actually in the same square that I'd run with the bulls like two years earlier. Uh, and so that was, it was kind of, or not two years, whatever, three years, four years earlier, but it was kind of like facing the fear of running with the bulls at that, at that place. And then facing the fear of getting COVID because it was the first time that we'd gotten it, you know? So it was just kind of like, I don't know, the square of overcoming fears, I guess, or something. <laughs> well, and I appreciate you all sharing that because, you know, over the past year, two years, three years now, you know, people have really been struggling with whether, you know, what they would do if they were in that situation where they were traveling on the Camino and they, they got COVID. Um, and so yours is a great example of, you know, being able to plan in advance, have something in mind, um, that you might do, uh, understand what's available to you through the healthcare system and then understand there's going to be some expenses involved with that as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it no one wants to be ill, you know? but yeah. <laughs> If you I've have to be fun. in a private room for an extended period, you know, that is something, whether it's your travel insurance or whether it's you preparing for that to save for that, or if you have the means to do it, um, it's something just to be aware of that it, that it may come up. You also mentioned, um, and I think we've seen this this year, that not everyone um, is as um, accommodating in yeah. self-care and may have continued yeah. on their Camino. So it's more likely than not when you have diseases that are transferred from person to person that you may have gotten it from someone who was walking. Well, I think Camino. we did. The very first night when we stayed in Roncesvalles, uh, or Roncesvalles, there was a guy that was coughing and 
very sick next to us. And then he actually, we, we kept getting reports about him being sick and falling and like doing other things. And so I think he was the one we got it from, but yeah, I mean, and you would just hear people like wheezing and coughing, like the COVID cough, like you heard it so much on the Camino when you were walking, we're like, ah, we're done with that. I don't know about so much. I think we were just hyper alert to anyone that coughed yeah, a little we bit. Might um, we did, so we did, I don't we... know if it's like rampant across the communo. But yeah. um yeah, I do think well the person that was running the um hotel we were staying at, one of the reasons why she allowed us to stay was because she was traveling in New York when she got COVID and just mm-hmm. was really appreciative of a place to stay. And so I think we yeah, it was just, it worked out really well that the people at the hotel were very understanding. Um, I think that was one of the toughest parts, not because we were just booking day by day in this hotel because we didn't know how soon until I got better. Oh, sure. Um, but then we didn't know if they would let us book again. It was like that axe holding over your head. I don't know. So if you get sick on the Camino and you get COVID and you get a hotel room, book it for like three or four days or like in advance so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the other thing was soup. I just wanted soup. Like you couldn't get soup and vegetables. I was just like, no, that's what my body needs. <laughs> Cultural differences, right? Cultural differences. Yeah, totally. So as two veteran Camino pilgrims, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of those things that make the Camino unique. Um, mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, taste buds notwithstanding. Um, what are some favorite um, dishes that you look for on the Camino besides vegetable soup? hands down tortilla like tortilla is my favorite i love it so much and my and my favorite place is uh titas in santiago so after you've gone all the way across i mean and i i've tried hundreds of tortillas along the way but titas has the <laughs> this is best. a veteran tortilla taster the, oh yeah absolutely a connoisseur you could say uh but they have the best in my opinion tortilla on the camino and they serve it as a tapa so you'll you know you'll get uh, your drink and then they'll give you a tortilla and it comes in a little pot like this. Instead of just a slice, it's in a pot and it's gooey and delicious and so good. <laughs> well, Chelsea, how about you? What's a favorite food on the Camino? I would have to agree with the tortilla. Like the days we don't stop to get tortilla in the morning, we miss it. <laughs> um, so that's like a very regular, we'll get on the road for about an hour, stop, get tortilla. Um, but I would say probably my favorite is the squash. Uh, squeeze orange juice is okay. also a breakfast thing but the zuma del naranja you can get it even like at some of the grocery stores you know put the fresh orange oranges on top then it squeezes it there for you and oh i could go for that every single day and <laughs> so, you did and i did <laughs> pretty much every day <laughs> Our regular listeners will know that I'm disappointed that neither of you said bacon bocadilla, but well, nonetheless, everyone has their own preferences and such. I do enjoy um, a good bacon bocadilla as well. I mean, you sure. have to, right? Like even yeah, when I was walking through Italy this summer, you know, I was looking for back bacon when I was in the UK a couple of years ago. It was, <laughs> okay, uh, can I pop in somewhere and get a bacon buddy? Wherever it is, I'm going for a back bacon sandwich, whatever you call it in awesome. your in your um, your area. Um, favorite city on the Camino favorite oh, for town. Me, that's easy. Like Casa Jerez by far my favorite place. There is something so special about that town. So special. I mean, it could be, it could be like that. There's like nuns there that have been praying for a thousand years consistently with a host. Like, so like years. maybe it's 500 years, but yeah, every day and night, 24 hours a day, there's somebody praying, uh, at the altar there, which right. is just, I don't know. It just gives it the, like there's something special about that town. That's for me. Uh, I have to ask: Is there some sort of cipher or anything that we should be on the lookout for there as well? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of things from the book in there for sure. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> tons of things. So, I mean, the skulls and crossbones, Arc of San Antone. Uh, inside each of the churches, there I talk about something unique inside each of the churches. One of the church has a pentagram on it, like in the stained glass window. But early Christendom that also meant like the five wounds of Jesus. And also the pentagram is like Venus's uh, every seven years, it will track that shape across the sky. So there's a lot of the sacred feminine in with that symbol as well. So just some, that's something fun to see too, because you don't always see a pentagram on a church stained glass window. No, it's not as popular. uh, I think not anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Chelsea, how about you? Uh, Any favorite towns or places on the Camino? Um, 
I mean, I will agree with Brian that one of the, I agreed with you last time too. <laughs> we must be married or something. We must be. <laughs> um, that I think a, a special place is the Arc of San Antonio and Casa Jerez, yeah. but that's just because that's where the book starts. And so, and we can both recite the first like page of the book by heart. And so um, it's just so special to see it. And I don't think we said this earlier, but when you're talking about landmarks and locations on the community, but you'll know the Arc of San Antonio when you walk under this huge arc, like huge archway that goes overhead. Like you can't miss it. You're going to walk under it and be like, oh, that's what they were talking about. And that's where the book starts. Right when you go under that archway, that's where the book starts. Um we, and we were talking about Osabrero. And I think mm. I I always like passing Osabrero because it just has yeah, a different do. feel to it. I don't know if um I don't know if I should say this, but the Galatia region is quite as warm and friendly as some of the others, but the architecture there just feels a little different. You feel like you've stepped back in time. Um I think it helped that the first night I was there, it was really like uh, misty over the mountains and it's just so beautiful to right. sit and see the sunrise um if you have a chance to do that yeah so i would say osabrero now the two of you talked in our in our previous episodes as you were, were recording on the camino about walking and brian you talked about this earlier walking pre-dawn walking under the stars um mm-hmm. and catching the sunrise is that a is that something that you found as being one of your uh, more preferable um, patterns and ways of walking the Camino? Always for me. Yeah. It's just like, there's something so special about that time. And I don't really like the heat that much later. <laughs> so it's nice <laughs> to get out of the heat. It's, it's good for a few reasons. Number one, like it's just special, amazing time. Uh, number two, you beat the heat. Number three, you beat the other pilgrims to the Albergues. <laughs> so those are just like three really special things there. But yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just something amazing about being by yourself, walking under stars. And if the moon is full, you don't have to use a flashlight. You can just, you can just see your way without anything. And you could be in any time period or anywhere, you know, and it's just like special. So we were talking about highlights before. I, I got to yeah. share one more with you because I, okay. I just remembered it. So <laughs> there's this silly little song that Chelsea and I made up. Uh, in 2019, we're out there called the Camino Shuffle. And it's a really fun song and you get to have verses. So you make up verses as you go through it. And so after we were sick, wait, we the, up, as you're walking, somebody's responsible for making up a, a verse or whatever. Yeah. You make a verse. Yeah. You make a verses for whatever good I'll, I'll do a little bit for you or read a little bit. I, okay. I a little freestyle love so Supreme coming in here with, uh, Brian I'm J. Skilling. I'm not a good singer just to let you know. So don't, don't hold me responsible. But one of my favorite parts radio was, down. Well, we we told our Camino family about this before we got separated with the COVID and we caught up with them. And when we did, we taught them all the Camino Shuffle. So we had like 20 people singing the Camino Shuffle with us. And we tried to make it, maybe it's like 12 people. And we tried to make up a verse for each person. And it was so much fun just coming up with different verses uh, for different different things. So that's the cool thing about the song is there's a chorus and then you just make up a verse about whatever you want to. So... Now you just you just said you're a really bad singer, but how how do these choruses uh, end up going? <laughs> All right, if you guys are ready, prepare. Let's yourself. put them up to it. Uh, everybody, go, you know, get a get a clap going there, so we can get uh, yeah, exactly. Brian oh, J. Skillin to, to sing a little. Uh... <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, oh, the Caminos ahead of us, Caminos behind. My friends walk beside me, stepping in time. There's pilgrims on the Camino. They get blisters on their feet. They do the pilgrim shuffle when their legs are beat. Oh, the Camino's ahead of us. Camino's behind. My friends walk beside me, stepping in time. And then you go into like make up different verses about different things as you go. I love it. I can't wait to do the bacon bacon bocadillo verse to the Camino shuffle. Oh, yes. Totally, totally do. It's yeah, very rhythmic, it right? So you've got like a lot of syllables there that you can play with in your in your timing and your meter. Yeah, okay, that's a challenge. I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, right join us for fun. the join us for the bonus <laughs> episode after the show. We'll uh, exactly. we'll put the bacon boca deal so verse of the Camino Shuffle. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. So, yeah. uh, in the brief time that we have left, let me ask the two of you: 
we've got the trilogy that is out now. The audio book is coming out um, very soon. Um, you've completed your Camino de Santiago. What are your next steps together and ahead? Sure. So, so for me, I'm, I, I'm writing a prequel to the series called The Black Templar. So that's the next step. And I've expanded the universe. So we have like the Through Philosophers trilogy, but I'm creating like the Camino de Santiago book series in which I'm going to have the trilogy. I'm going to have the Black Templar. I'm going to do my own biography uh, that takes place on the Camino and a couple of other things. So I've expanded to more of like just from this trilogy into the Camino de Santiago book series, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And That's so fantastic. There's that. We've had people come up and show interest in making it into a film. Um, so I've had one person want to option it. So I'd rather do a TV show than a film. But like I said, I just wanted this story to inspire a million people to go, like however that happens, whether it's here, if it gets made into a movie or TV show or whatever, or if you help me with marketing and we're just like, kill it. I, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> if you need like a background actor in the Amazon Prime serial of through the There you go. Stars. Perfect. <laughs> Choose your character. <laughs> Chelsea, what's, well, a, what's also, on your bucket list? What's coming ahead? Um, well, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I first, so I started my first ever real job. I say that in quotes too, because Brian and I had our own business before this, but this is mm -hmm. the first time I've worked for someone else, like a nine to five. I just started right after the Camino. Um, so I am right now, like every day my head feels like it's going to explode because I have so much more information coming in. And so I'm really excited about that. I work for a volunteer agency and we set up long-term volunteer opportunities around the world where people can go volunteer at nonprofits and we cover your expenses once you're there. So all your living expense, your food and your housing and your insurance, your transportation, like that's all covered. And so just giving people up awesome opportunities to help serve people that um, underserved populations and just gain awesome experiences. And um, yeah, so that's going to be a new journey. You know, Brian and I have traveled the world and been a lot of places. And so we just moved to Chicago area and um, starting this new adventure of working for this nonprofit, not working for it. I'm directing so, it. So I was, um, I was just going to say, Chelsea's the director of the nonprofit and this was, this yeah. was her dream job. So our business that she was talking about is we actually, after we'd launched our series, uh, we had a lot of authors coming to us, help asking them to help do the same with their books. So we, we pretty much, yeah, we created a business called publishing hackers and a course called from Kickstarter to Amazon bestseller. And so far we've helped like many authors get to Amazon bestseller in several categories, which has been really fun. And the business was doing amazing, but then Chelsea got this opportunity to like, this is her dream job. Like, and she's so good at it. That's Just amazing. like helping people. And it's, I'm so proud of her. <laughs> Absolutely. I miss, her, I miss her in my business. I miss her in Thank our you. business. Though. <laughs> um, yeah. If you want to connect with Brian and Chelsea, we've got them linked down below in the show notes, including the social media. The trilogy series, Through a Field of Stars, The Way Through the Field of Stars, Back Through a Field of Stars, Home Through a Field of Stars is available at throughafieldofstars.com. Author Brian J. Skillen, Chelsea Skillen, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. It's been great to spend time with you. Until we're together next, um, be well and stay safe and buen camino. Buen camino. Yes, thank you for having us on. This has been the Sacred Steps Podcast. To help other pilgrims find the show, please leave a star rating on your podcast app. For episode notes, links from the show, or to contact Kevin, visit our website at sacredstepspodcast.com. You can also join our behind the mic email list on the website. Before you go, tap subscribe so our future episodes are available to you automatically.